Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just want you to um, uh, well, I just want to welcome you to Karen Mapp's presentation that uh, CPIC is putting on tonight. Before we get into it, we just want to take a few seconds to do some housekeeping items, and that is that uh, due to the uh, overwhelming response we have to this, we have everybody's microphone muted, so that if uh, we can hear Karen Mapp do her presentation without all the background noise. If you do have a question to ask, uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, you will see chat. And in that area, you can uh, type a question. If you uh, want to ask a question of Care Map, we will keep the questions and collate them. And at the end, when there's time, I will we ask those questions. Um, also, there is also a questions tab as well. If you want to type in the questions there, and uh, we will keep track of that. And at the same time, at the end, we will um, ask Care Map those questions. So we'd like to thank you uh, for participating. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Karen Mapp. Um, Dr. Mapp is currently a lecturer at, at, at the Education at Harvard in Boston. She brings to the table over 20 years of experience, research and practice in the cultivation of partnership amongst families, community members, and educators that support student achievement and school improvement. Dr. Mapp currently serves as a consultant on family engagement to the United States Department of Education in the Office of Innovation and Improvement. A more comprehensive bio will be available on the CPEC on a on a page that you uh, can view it when you view this later. So, without further ado, and keeping with our mandate and our commitment to parent engagement, your CPEC is thrilled to welcome Dr. Karen Mapp to speak to us tonight about um, our uh, education of our children. Dr. Mapp. Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you all for taking time out from your busy schedules uh, to be on this webinar and so um, I'd like to try it as soon as the PowerPoint there it is comes up I hope everyone can see it and um, I'm going to go ahead and get started my plan is to talk for maybe about uh, 30 minutes and then give people a chance to type in questions we do have someone who is going to uh, serve as sort of the moderator of the questions and then They'll read them to me and I'll try to do the best I can to answer them. Okay, so let's see if we can get this to work. Here we go. Um, so first of all, I, I want to tell you a little bit about um, my experience and then also to, to talk about the definition of family engagement. Um, I've been doing this work now uh, for about 20 years. The reason why I got involved in researching family engagement was because I had done work as an admissions um, associate director of admissions at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, which afforded me the opportunity to visit uh, many high schools throughout the United States. And, and in that position, I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of teenagers about why they felt they were successful in school because uh, Trinity College, some of you may be aware of the college, is a highly selective school and I was interviewing students who had done quite well in high school. I was interviewing students from all different backgrounds um, in terms of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status because one of the efforts that I was coordinating was to make sure that Trinity had a diverse student population. Um, and diverse students applying to the college. So I was very curious um, what the students would tell me were the secrets of their success. And I actually was quite stunned when um, over and over again the students would talk about family engagement. And by the way, when I say parent or family member um, in this conversation with you tonight, I mean any adult caretaker. So. That could range from uh, foster parents, grandparents, um, people we refer to as fictive kin. Those are relatives that nobody really knows quite if or how they're related to you, but they are very important people in your lives. Uh, these could be older brothers or sisters. So not just biological parents, but any adult caretaker. And I was, I as I mentioned, I was quite stunned that the students over and over again talked about the importance of their families because I had always heard that first of all uh, adolescents um, it was perceived that they did not desire their families to be engaged 
um, and did everything to keep that from happening. This is what I had been told by the adults, uh, family members and teachers and guidance counselors. Um, so I was, I was quite stunned and um, the fact of the matter that every single student mentioned it uh, made me realize that this was a really important element of student achievement. And when I would go back and talk with guidance counselors and teachers and tell them that students had told me this, they were also stunned and quite frankly, they didn't believe me. And um, when I asked them, you know, what kinds of things were they doing, was, was the education system doing to cultivate more of this type of engagement, um, many times the response I got back was that the schools felt they were doing all they could and really the parents uh, didn't care. The ones who weren't engaged just didn't care. So I, I found this curious and um, decided that I wanted to study it because again I was very um, influenced by the students because I did talk to many hundreds if not um, over a thousand students in my career at, at Trinity and I decided that this was something that was was very important if we were going to try to stitch together explanations and then strategies to improve student achievement and also uh, improve our schools. So what do we really mean by family engagement? Because there's sort of lots of different definitions swirling around out there and for purposes of this discussion I'm going to say that you know family engagement really means any way that a parent or parents um, uh, any adult caretaker participates in the growth and development of their child or children. So, um, you know, these are any effective ways that we find that families are involved in their children's education. And so, uh, when families are effectively engaged, you know, then what are some of the roles that they play? And so, I've, I've asked this question too of a lot of family members, of teachers, wherever I go when I do conferences. Um, and in the research I've done, I've sort of collected uh, lots of responses and feedback to this question about, so when families are engaged, what do those roles look like? What are the different ways that they can express this thing that we call engagement? So what we found is that um, parents can really be engaged in many, many, many ways. And I want to sort of emphasize this. I'm going to go through these roles. Because sometimes I have found that schools and other education institutions narrowly define family engagement. And they will actually honor or encourage or validate certain types of engagement and not recognize other types. The other thing is, is there are some misperceptions about the roles and the activities that families can do that supports students' learning. For example, we now know from the research that um, being overly engaged in helping homework is actually um, and has an adverse effect on student achievement. And I know a lot of people think that you know helping with homework is the only way or the most significant way that families can be engaged. But there's lots of different things that families can do that we have now found from the research. So first of all, obviously, supporters of their children's learning. And this could be anything from making sure there's a place and time that students um, do homework and that students know that uh, education is important to their family members. This could be, um, especially when the child is younger, uh, reading with, and, and I say that, I say with um, intentionally, reading with children and not just two children, we call this active reading. So for the little ones, especially the children from sort of um, zero to, to, to three, um, this kind of active reading and discussion and talking about life is very important to help uh, develop children's literacy. So those are just some examples of sort of supporters of their children's learning. The second one, encouragers of an achievement identity. This is really important and we are in fact um, being, being able to see from the research that this might be one of the most important ways that a family member can be involved and why this is very important and shines a lot of light on the on family engagement is because this is a role that oftentimes gets um, uh, overlooked especially when we have families that may be new to our country so here in the United States I know in, in Canada as well 
you may have families who are new to the country and a lot of times people think well if they can't get involved with the homework if they can't do the math if they don't understand the lessons then how could they really be significantly engaged in any meaningful way well we know now that encouraging just telling the child you can do it um, creating a can-do spirit building their confidence letting them know that you know if you have a challenge you know we, we believe in you that you can solve the problem this has an incredible impact on a child's confidence and efficacy and it has an incredible impact on their willingness to um, move beyond a problem and try to solve it and not give up so a very very important role for family members to play is to be there to encourage uh, their children to to stick with it and also build their confidence. Obviously, monitors of children's time, behavior, and setting boundaries and providing resources for children is very, very important. Uh, one of the other thing that, things that the teenagers did tell me, which again was a surprise to me, was they do appreciate it when their parents set boundaries. Uh, they don't express that at the time that the boundary is being set. I think any of you in the audience who have teenagers know what I'm talking about. Um, they don't always say yippee when you tell them that it's time to shut down the computer or get off of Facebook. But in the end, they do appreciate it because they know that it's very important. In fact, the teenagers told me that they thought family engagement um, in their adolescent years was actually more important than at any other time of their lives because they realize that so there's a lot of uh, distractions and uh, you know, not helpful feedback that they may be getting from others. So they do appreciate the fact that you are monitoring their time and providing boundaries for them. Another role that families engage in that's very important is being models of lifelong learning and having enthusiasm for education. We have um, here in the States um, a program and an initiative that seems to be popping up across districts. And that um, are things like parent academies and parent universities, where, for example, here in Boston, we have over 2,000 parents every year who take classes uh, that are very much aligned with the academic goals of the district. And many parents have gotten back to us and told us that uh, when their children see them being engaged in the learning process, you know, doing their own homework and asking questions that it actually makes the children feel like, you know, now that I see my parent really getting engaged in education, I see them, you know, learning, that makes me want to do the same. We've actually had some very um, powerful letters written by the children about what it means to them to have their parents in parent university. We have a graduation at the end of parent university where parents get a certificate. It's, it's not a certificate for credit. Um, it's more symbolic, but I can tell you that at those ceremonies, there isn't a dry eye in the house. People bring, you know, loads of family members because for some of our parents, this is the first time they've actually attended and participated in a graduation. So this is a way that, you know, our parents um, become uh, models of lifelong learning. Advocates. This happens to be a term that I know um, in working with educators, I was Deputy Superintendent for Family and Community Engagement here in Boston. I had 145 schools and school leaders that reported to me. And some of my school leaders were very nervous about this term advocate because they felt that advocate meant adversary. And that um, if parents were advocates, then that meant they, were, they saw trouble ahead, they saw battles, they saw, um, you know, arguments. Well, you know, that's part of the work. I, I will admit to you that that is part of the work because, of course, our families are very focused on their children and they want the best for their children. But advocate also means that your families can also support the work of the schools. Um, they, can, they can fight for learning opportunities and programming and you know for for uh, actual uh, things that will benefit the school so I'm, I'm hoping that people don't see the role of parents as advocate in a negative lens because it actually is very positive you know also when we have families at advocates that actually provides an accountability backstop 
it actually, you know, makes us sit up and take notice because we know our parents are paying attention. And there's nothing wrong with being held accountable. So I think actually grooming our parents to be advocates is a very smart thing to do uh, for, our, for our districts and for the future of our schools. Decision makers and choosers. So this is opportunities for family members to actually get involved in making educational decisions at the school level, but also um, working on uh, making decisions about other educational options for their children. So some families make decisions to provide extra help and support for their children. And uh, this is the decision maker role. And then finally, collaborators. So this is an opportunity for our parents to actually collaborate with school staff and members of the community on many issues. And so these are the different roles and, you know, they, they not, these um, terms here may not capture every single role. I'm sure if we were able to open up the floodgates and get your responses, we'd see other um, adjectives to describe the role. But I think this pretty much captures it. But the main point that I want to make here is that I want you to think about the diversity of the roles, that it's not just, you know, sometimes parents think about um, and, and schools think about family engagement as just volunteering at the school or just being engaged in fundraising activities. Well, you know, those things are nice, but A, not all families can engage in those activities. And I oftentimes see that sometimes when parents can't, they get labeled as not caring. Um, and what's also important here is that I think we as educators have to start thinking about how do we cultivate these various roles. What can we do in terms of the kinds of activities we have at school to try to cultivate these different roles? Um, and so, for example, when there are parents who can't come to school all the time, or maybe ever because they work two or three jobs, how can we make them feel confident that some of the things that they're doing at home, say, uh, provide them or give them opportunities to learn like what are some of the things that you can say to really encourage your child and, and to build that can-do spirit? You know, if we can really think about building the capacity of our families to take on some of these roles, and even if they're not roles that can be done at school, that they're just, they're still very impactful when it comes to um, an influence on students. Okay. So let's talk about why this engagement is so important. And so these different roles, what, what do they actually, what kind of impact do they actually have on, on uh, various aspects when it comes to education? And this is the question that I get asked a lot when I go out, especially when I work with educators. You know, this all sounds good. Uh, we, we think family engagement is, is important, but is it really that important? Isn't what happens in the classroom the most important thing? And if we've got to make decisions about scarce resources, um, why are we going to spend our time and money on family engagement? So let's talk a little bit about uh, why family engagement is important and the outcomes that we see. So I'm going to talk about some of the research from um, a book called A New Wave of Evidence. And what we did was we looked at 51 studies that were done across the United States to try to figure out when there were family engagement interventions, what were some of the results, what were some of the outcomes that were seen when a school system or schools spent time or, or even after school programs spent time really focusing on building those roles in families. What were some of the things that they saw? So first of all, what we see is uh, faster literacy acquisition. And there have been some studies done which actually highlight the fact that when families are engaged in their children's education, uh, we see the children uh, read faster, uh, they read with more fluency, and it's very, very important, especially for our, our young people, our, our youngsters, to have their families engaged because, again, there's been some studies done by the National Family Literacy Center which show uh, two or three years of advancement uh, when it comes to literacy rates between children whose families read to them or, or read with them 
and, and children whose families do not have the opportunity to do that. What else do we see? These are the children who, uh, oh, um, things are jumping around here a little bit. Uh, let me go back. Okay, I seem to have lost my ability to move the slides forward. So um, I'll try again. I see that I have two cursors here, uh, my cursor and another one. So I'm not so sure whether or not we are moving the way we should be, but I will try to continue to move these forward. Okay, so I've gone back one. All right, so the students are also able to earn higher grades and test scores when their families are engaged in their children's education. And so this is a study by PISA, and some of you may know of the PISA program. Um, I'll go back. And this is where 15-year-old students whose parents often read books with them during their first year of primary school show markedly higher PISA scores than students whose parents read infrequently with them or not at all. Um, the performance advantage among students whose parents read to them early in their school years is evident regardless of a family's socioeconomic status. And so what this says is that it doesn't matter a family's background in terms of their education, their race, their ethnicity. Um, when families are engaged and read to their kids and read with their kids actively, um, it doesn't matter the background, it still has an impact. And then finally, family engagement with their 15-year-olds is strongly associated with P better PISA performance. And so again, PISA is the Program for International Student Assessment. It's usually the indicator that's used to compare, to compare countries when it comes to their students' literacy and math acquisition. And so what the PISA study is finding, so this is an international study, is that family engagement makes a huge difference in PISA scores. Um, now, that last check mark, what they're emphasizing is that families have to continue to be engaged in their children's education. So talking to their kids about school, talking to their kids about current events, all of those things have an impact. And as I mentioned to you before, our teenagers are saying that family engagement in the adolescent years is important. I emphasize that because many times what I hear in school systems is that family engagement drops off at the secondary school level. And it's not just because families think that their engagement isn't important. They also sometimes receive signals from the school that family engagement is not important at this level. So this is something we have to keep in mind um, at the secondary level. So what else do we see? These are the students who enroll in higher level programs. And by that, I mean that these are students who get involved in you know, honors courses. So when their families are engaged in their uh, education, we see a correlation with student involvement and enrollment in higher level programs. These are also the students who are promoted on time, who graduate on time and earn more credits. These are also students who adapt better to school and attend more regularly. So your attendance rates are something that you see that go up when families are engaged. These are students who have better social skills and behavior. So I have many teachers who tell me that because of their family engagement efforts, that they don't have the classroom management problems that some of their other colleagues have. So when schools really reach out to parents and try to cultivate that engagement, this is one of the outcomes. And then finally, these are the students who graduate and go on to higher education. So you can see that there's a pretty significant impact of family engagement on student achievement. Now, this does not mean that the school isn't important. So this is in conjunction with what's going on in the school. You still need to have uh, you know, strong leadership. You still need to have strong professional staff. But what you find is when you add in the family engagement, that acts as an accelerant to student achievement. This is indeed a study that was done by um, some folks from Chicago. It's called Organizing Schools for Improvement Lessons from Chicago. 
And what they found was that, indeed, family engagement is what they call one of five essential supports. So that's the third, number three, um, it says parent and community ties. What this diagram is saying is that these are the different elements that go into making sure that what happens in that classroom, and that's, that's represented by that purple box and that triangle, and it says I see, that's the instructional core. So my colleague here at Harvard, Richard Elmore, talks about the instructional core as the relationship between the student and the teacher in the presence of content. That relationship, that instructional core is impacted by these five essential supports. Leadership as the driver for change. So you have to have strong leadership, both at the district level and in the schools. You have to have that professional capacity so that the people in the school building um, are, are, are good and effective. Uh, not that they have to know how to do everything right off, but they're open to learning and there's a learning community created at the school. Number three, parent or community ties. There's got to be family engagement, strong communication, and collaboration between the school, the family, and the community. A student-centered learning climate where students are at the center of the enterprise, not the adults, and that the learning is relevant to the students, and that finally there's instructional guidance. So that would be your professional development and good support for not just your staff, I'm finding, but we're also having schools talk about the support for parents. So how? How do we do all of this? Because that's the biggest question I have. It's okay, now we know that family engagement is important, we see the impact, but how do we do it? Well, what we're finding through the research is that the key element in building partnerships with families, and I'm going to focus pretty much tonight on family engagement, is the amount of trust that there is between home and school, the amount of respect that there is between home and school. So in other words, the relationships. I often say that, you know, a lot of times when we say, we have this saying around the world about what are the three most important things you have to remember if you are trying to purchase a home or you're trying to find a place or space for a business? It's location, 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 all right? Everybody around the world knows that because I've asked that question everywhere. Um, I often say to uh, people who are really trying to figure out, you know, how do we cultivate these partnerships? The three things that you have to remember, relationship, relationship, relationship. If you do not build relationships with families, they will not come to the events. They will not respond to the phone calls. They will not respond to the flyers. You know, I'm reading some student papers right now, and one of my students talks about how she, she said that she tried everything. She tried sending notices home through in the book bags with her students. She tried making phone calls. She tried, um, you know, at, uh, doing emails. And she said, nothing I did helped. And then I asked her, did you ever meet one-on-one -on -one with any of these families? Did you introduce yourself? Did you talk about yourself? Did you try to build relationships with them, um, you know, face-to-face? -face? And she said, you know, I never did that. Well, bingo. Without those kinds of relationships, it's very difficult for people to want to work together and collaborate. So what we found and what I found in the research, because this is really the aspect of the work that I focus on quite a bit, is how do we get family engagement off the ground? We found that when, when programs and initiatives really intentionally and purposefully focus on building relationships with families and also community members, these are the programs that are effective in creating and sustaining meaningful partnerships. So these are the schools you know, that everybody says, well, wow, how is it that when they have an event, they have two or 300 people? How is it that families always talk about feeling like they're a member of that school's family? That's why, because they've spent time on building partnerships. What else do we know about meaningful partnerships and what is focused on? Well, I mentioned a little bit earlier in this session that we've now learned that family engagement at home is really the factor that is the most effective in supporting student learning. And so many of these programs that really focus on helping families figure out how to support their children's learning out of school, in the community, at home, 
are the kinds of programs that families are really interested in. Um, I've sat in on plenty of parent-teacher conferences where the time is spent sort of critiquing the student work, but there isn't enough time talking to them about, okay, so like, how can we, what can we do together? Um, you know, families, members, tell me what you're already doing, because it's great to validate families to find out what they're already doing first. Let's think of some strategies for how we can help support uh, the child's learning. Again, family engagement has a protective effect. This slide is mainly there to, again, encourage family engagement at the secondary school level. So family members out there who are listening, you know, it's, it's really important for you to stay in it. The way you're engaged is different. So uh, it may not be that, again, you sit down and, and you try to help with the homework, but you, again, the encouragement piece is really important here because we all, we all know how sometimes uh, adolescents can, can get, um, you know, knocked off center pretty quickly when there's a challenge or a problem. And so that encouragement here is really important. When, the, you, when your students know at that age that you're behind them, that you're going to provide them with that support. They do much better in school and, um, you know, they really will stay in school. We don't have the pro as many problems with, with dropout when you find that the students are really engaged, when they know that the families are engaged at the high school level. Um, I want to bring up that families are very appreciative when the engagement activities are linked to improving student learning. And we know now that family engagement initiatives that are linked to learning have the greatest effect on achievement. Now that sounds pretty common. That You would say, well, that's common sense. But I want you to think about the times when you've gone to an educational activity and it has had nothing to do with learning. I have gone to many open houses where the open house is pretty much parents get there, the school leader speaks about the rules and regulations of the school, you know, the attendance policy, the discipline policy. Parents then leave and go to their child's classroom where they hear more rules about the, um, you know, supplies that have to, the parents have to buy or, again, some of the policies and procedures. But they aren't given an opportunity at those events to really learn about you know, what are the goals in terms of academic achievement? What should my child know and be able to do by the time they finish this grade? What are some of the strategies that we could be using at home to help? And maybe we even get a chance to practice one of those strategies at this meeting, because a lot of times we make the mistake of just giving our parents a list. And that doesn't, doesn't help if they don't know how to do what it is you have on the list. So this is very important. Um, the other thing we need to do is to be mindful of the fact that we've got to create environments for our children, that um, for our families that are really helpful. And so um, I'm getting the impression since the slides have been moved forward quickly that uh, we've got to that I've got to wrap this up and give you a chance to answer some questions. So basically, um, what I was going to say was that uh, your schools have to provide a welcoming environment to parents. That they also have to Make sure they honor parents' voice, and also make sure you always focus um, the engagement on the kids, that the initiatives should be really focused on the students and not on the adults. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to whoever is going to monitor the questions, and I'll try to do the best I can to answer them. Hi, Karen, um, and everybody else. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself earlier. My name is Josh Davistein. I'm the uh, chair of the Halton CPIC. Also online, we have Lisa Coster, past chair of CPIC. Good evening. And we have Renata uh, Lewis. I can never say her name right, so I'll let her do that. And she's also a member of CPIC. Um, what Renata and I are going to do is we are going to um, ask Karen some of the questions that have come up. And, and she can have then have a chance to answer those uh, questions. Um, question number one is, Karen, how can helping children with their homework have adverse effects? Please explain. Well, what we're finding is that the over-tendency of families uh, to be engaged in their children's homework um, is sometimes an indicator of the child having some struggles in school. Um, so what the research is showing is that, and it also has showed us that in many cases, 
because the way that we may have learned um, is very different from the way that children are being taught, sometimes it actually acts as a way to confuse the child. The child is sort of using one set of, learning one set of strategies from home, which is based on some old school um, strategies, and then the school is actually teaching them differently. We've, we've seen that here in Boston. We use something called Turks here, which is a more um, uh, analytic way of teaching mathematics, whereas, you know, the way that a lot of our parents learned was rote. And so consequently, it sometimes causes um, a real disconnect and, and confuses the child. So we found that uh, what the research is telling us is that, um, you know, an over, over um, involvement in homework actually can use to some, lead to some um, detrimental academic outcomes for the kids. Thank you, Karen. Uh, the next question we have, it says, how do you encourage teenage daughters to open up and talk to their parents about their experience at school, issues, and to seek advice? That is a really good question. And what I have found is a great way to get answers to those questions. This is one of those things that schools can do is to um, actually have um, support groups <laughs> for parents uh, to talk about these issues and to share strategies. One of the things that I suggest you do is have to be a little cagey about how you ask the question because if you ask your child, what did you do in school today, um, the answer is going to be what? Nothing, right? So um, you have to be, um, have some different strategies about asking them, so you know, what was like the most fun thing you learned today? Uh, was there anything that happened in school today that surprised you? Um, you know, they're actually online. I've, I've seen some, um, some questions that um, some school districts have created for families of adolescents to ask their child. Uh, but this is a good, this, this always makes for a good conversation if the schools actually set up a time for parents to sort of share strategies. So I would encourage that. Um, to perhaps have some support groups or some focus groups. And the other thing that I found is ask your, your, your teenage daughter's friends what to ask. They always spill the beans. So whenever I want to know how to deal with teenagers, I always ask another teenager. And they often tell me some really good strategies. OK. Um, just as an aside, we have a few people that have raised their hand. Um, instead of raising your hand, if you can ask a question, and then we can read them off. Next question. Engagement is important but time-consuming. Parents these days work all day, are tired. When they get home, they need rest. How do you reconcile that? Um, well, it's, it's difficult, I know, but your engagement is so important. Um, it doesn't have to be time-consuming. It could be some, uh, you know, a, a small amount of time that you spend talking to your child or, you know, supporting them. It also doesn't have to ha it can happen when you're doing um, normal daily events. So, for example, um, at the dinner table, which I hope, you know, I, I do think that it's important to have a time where the family uh, can get together to talk. I think that um, it's been a, a little bit tricky with some of the societal norms that we have now where, you know, kids have, to, there's TVs in every room and everybody sort of retreats to their own spot. But, but having and setting aside some time for family conversation, I think is really important. So it, it doesn't always have to take forever, but um, I think it's important to try to have some time each day. There's, for example, some work I'm doing in, in Dubai. They've just launched a campaign called Three a Day, and they encourage parents to do three things, talk about life, um, share stories and ask your kids about, you know, encourage your, and be, uh, encourage your children. So to try to do one of those things each day. Um, and again, it doesn't always have to take a lot of time, but I think it has to be strategic and, and um, your children have to really see that, that you care about these things. Okay. Um, the next question says, I have always encouraged reading when young, but now I cannot, got, cannot get him to enjoy or read a book. I feel this affects his ability to understand academically and socially. My son is 16 years old. I am not a literacy expert, um, and so unfortunately I don't have um, 
the best strategies, but this is one of those things that I think talking to your child's teacher could really be helpful um, to say, listen, you know, I know he's struggling with reading, um, is not enjoying reading. What are some of the things that we could do together to try to help him? So um, I would really encourage you to talk to your child's teacher about that. Um, and then maybe ask him some questions about, so what is it about reading that you don't like? I also find that sometimes teenagers go through phases with reading, um, but, but I'm, I, I sh again, li I'm not a literacy expert, um, so I don't want to lead you astray, but I would really recommend that you talk to the teachers at the school to see if they can give you some advice, and you can work together with them on some strategies. Okay, next question we have is what to do when you have a good family engagement but the child does not listen or attend to our involvement? Um, well, I'm not so sure what the questioner means by good family engagement. I mean, again, children are going to push back. I mean, one of the things that I always encourage parents to do is to try to read up a little bit on the different developmental stages of, of kids because you know when they get to be a certain age middle school it's normal for them to push back so um, you know they're not always going to be cooperative unfortunately but that doesn't mean you should give up that doesn't mean you should give up um, you know it sometimes means trying different strategies I know people who have several children who tell me you know what worked with 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 Carla did not work with Elaine I just had to try different things but do know that, that your children are going to push back. That's normal. But that doesn't mean that they don't want you engaged. So you can't be sort of fooled and bamboozled by that resistance. Oh, okay, they want to see if they, they actually want to see if they can make you give up. Um, and, and you don't want to give up uh, because then they feel, in some cases, students have told me that they feel abandoned. They're going to push back, but they don't really want you to, to turn away from them. I, I would agree with you on that, Karen. Um, next question we have is, what initiatives do you have to disengage teachers from their PCs, iPods, etc., in order to engage them with more meaningful one-to-one -one discussions? I'm not so sure I understand that question. Okay, so I think what they're looking at is, how do you, how do you unplug them so that you'll actually be um, interacting with them away from all the electronic devices. Oh, did, oh so did, you said teenagers or teachers? Teenagers, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought it was <laughs> teachers because I was going to say, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> uh, again, I'm, I'm sort of, my expertise lies more in the relationship between, between home and school. Um, I think some of these questions have to do with youth development. And so, you know, I, this is not the area that I research. Um, my area of research is more trying to figure out how we can cultivate better partnerships between home and school. Um, and I actually think some of these questions are great topics for uh, in Halton for there to be some parent-teacher meetings where parents can ask these kinds of questions and have the experts on youth development answer them. Sorry, so if there's questions uh, about multitasking. Um, the next question is the best thing my son's teacher said to my husband and I was, "I'll send you home happy, and I expect you to send him home happy and ready to learn." That's not really a question, but it was just a, a, a statement. Um, next question: Do you do you not think that teachers should update parents more frequently than once or twice a year as to how their children are doing in school? Allowing parents to get involved, especially when necessary. Often you don't realize there are problems until you're halfway through the school year. Absolutely. There's, there, this is one of the things that I am working on with school districts around the country is to figure out how to do more effective communication between home and school. Twice a year is not enough. Um, and you know, there's got to be some other strategies. I mean, this is where technology may actually help in some cases, not all cases, because not all families have technology. But um, absolutely. And, you know, there are some systems that are, are being developed 
um, for example, in New York City, they have a, a system where in libraries and in public spaces, there are computers available uh, where families can get on a system where it has information about their children, where teachers update it daily, and it has information on how their child has done on a particular test or um, you know, positive uh, feedback. And so I think I've forgotten what the acronym is for the system, but these are all new things that are being created so that they can be, that parents can have more data about um, what's happening with their child, more evidence, more artifacts, and then receive some feedback on how to support their children's learning. But once or twice a year is not enough, and I find many times that those meetings, in many cases, are more formulaic, and there, there really isn't as much substance um, that's shared at a lot of those meetings. And I know it, this is why I think we have to sort of relook at the way we do parent-teacher conferences. Okay, um, what are the top three things a parent can do to engage with their children and their school? At what age? Because it does, it's a little bit different. Um, again, I think if we went back to the, uh, to the um, roles, is to look at those roles. And so first of all, you know, um, be a supporter and an encourager. Um, but I think also, you know, at finding out from the teacher, so again, um, what should my child know and be able to do by the end of the year? What are some of the most important strategies? And know I am an ally. Um, I think a lot of times, again, that sometimes there's a disconnect between home and school, and there's an impression that um, you know we're at each we're we're, we're enemies. Um, I think the more that both school and home can work to say, you know, what we need to do is collaborators and partners and allies. So uh, I think it's really important to let your schools know that again. It, it doesn't always work. I know that sometimes this is hard work, but um, you know, again, encouraging. We know for a fact that encouraging your children uh, and and helping them gain that confidence is probably the number one strategy you can use in terms of helping them with their with their achievement. Wouldn't next question? Wouldn't that type of confusion ex exist from year to year? with different teaching methods from different teachers. I'm sorry. Are you They're talking about the confusion that exists from year to year with different teaching methods from different teachers. Well, no, because most of the different teaching methods are on a developmental timeline. So, um, you know, a lot of times the curriculum that's created from year to year is on a timeline. So depending on where the child is, the child might be ready for, you know, the more advanced method. Um, so that's that's over a span of time. Whereas, you know, if the child that day is received particular instruction about how to solve a word problem, and that same night they're receiving a whole different set of strategies from someone else, that's when it's confusing. Um, next one says, my son is in grade 10. Our family is fully involved with his studies. We follow up in general. However, we don't follow up too much on his homework, projects, etc., because he is a bright student. Are we doing the right thing? Should we poke into details if he is up to date with his homework, etc.? Well, if he's doing well, um, I think that you've kind of answered your own question so that you know, uh, I think, again, asking his teacher, checking in, or his teachers, saying, you know, how's he doing? Is there anything else we could be doing? You could even ask him, you know, how, how are you feeling about, um, you know, your work? Is there anything you need from us? Is there anything else we could be doing? We just wanted to, it's, the checking in is so important to the teenagers. Uh, just asking, even if they say no, just asking is really important to them. Um, I think when we start ignoring them, we get we we get the impression, or we think that, you know, oh well, they're okay, so we'll just leave them alone. They really still still want that security of knowing that you care. So yes, periodically asking and checking in, I think, is important. I think you know they'll let you know if you're being overbearing, and again, sometimes you have to take that with a grain of salt. But um, I think checking in is is appropriate. 
Next question. My 15-year-old is starting to feel stressed with the upcoming exams. How can we as parents, guardians, help redirect negative comments by our teens to help them keep focused with the upcoming workload and, can, and concern they will uh, uh, as they, and then the question got funny, but you, um, you have the most gist of it there. How can you help kids with the upcoming exams? Again, encourage, level? encourage, encourage. Let them know that these tests do not, uh, are not a reflection of, you know, who they are, how smart they are, they are a moment in time. Um, you know, again, uh, make sure that they get enough sleep, make sure they get, they've eaten properly. But it is, you know, this, this test craze we're on right now is, is, is stressful and problematic to all of us. Um, and so, I, again, I think letting the kids know that you expect that they're going to do great. Um, you give them, you know, very positive feedback. Don't worry. You do your best. And, um, you know, it's, it's not a reflection of who you are. It's a moment in time. Again, uplifting, you know, encouraging words. I think are really important. They're going to be stressed out. Um, I think all of us can remember those days with, with the testing. But whatever you can do to encourage them and, and, and have them think positive, I think is really important. Okay. Is there Minimize such a stress. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. And well, is there such a thing as being over engaged? Well, um, sometimes when I talk to teachers, and you know, there's been quite a few articles written about things like they have, there's a term that some of you may know called helicopter parents, um, where, uh, you know, school staff feel like some families um, are over-engaged. Um, but look, you know, I think all families really, what, the, what, what they're trying to do is to do the best for their child. And... Um, you know, I encourage school staff to have, you know, open and honest conversations, but respectful conversations with families uh, if they feel that perhaps the parent may be going too far or the parents might be going too far in one direction or the other. I mean, it's all a part of working out these relationships between home and school. And, and you know, it's hard work, and, and there's always going to be, you know, um, some misunderstandings, but I think if you build that relationship and the foundation of the relationship is one of trust, you can get over these hurdles um, a lot easier if, if there's been no relationship built and the only dialogue between home and school has been negative. And the next question is, there has been a lot of great information tonight about impacting children's academic success, but would you have any suggestions about how we can better engage as parents to ensure their social success at school. Same advice. The same, the same, um, you know, one of the things that, that um, I showed on one of the slides was that um, being engaged in your children's education in those different roles, again, encouraging and monitoring time and uh, modeling learning, those have, when I say um, student achievement and development, the development means their social, their emotional, their physical, maybe even their spiritual development. So it's the same kinds of things um, of impact the whole child. And we're not just talking about sort of cognitive, but we're talking about um, the other forms of development as well. Okay. All right. Next question. This is great, but are our school administrators being given the same message? Is parent engagement a focus of the school administrators, and if so, how is this collaboration from the school's perspective being encouraged or promoted? Lisa, you want to answer that one? Lisa, Sorry, I didn't, are you there? I, see, I didn't have my, my mic on. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not an administrator. <laughs> I'm a parent just like the Josh and um, Renata are. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would say, uh, Karen, is perhaps you can talk about how you, I, I'm not an administrator either, but you can talk about how you, you um, the discussion you had that you did come and present to the administrators as well, the same sort of theme. Right, and I, I think that um, in the district there have been other professional development events 
above and beyond me coming. I did come um, to uh, the Halton School District and did speak with the administrators and we did workshops, but I also know that there's an intention to continue that kind of dialogue. So yes, yeah. my, my intent, most of the work I do was I really push the school districts to do capacity building on both um, the side of families and school staff because if you don't uh, build the capacity of both, you end up with this disequilibrium. You end up with parents who may, you know, um, really learn a lot and want more and want to go to the school and learn more and then you have maybe schools that aren't so welcoming. So um, I often encourage, you know, there to be professional development uh, on both sides. So yes, I have worked with your administrators and I do believe there's more work that's intended, maybe not with me, but with other uh, professional development activities. It's also worth um, pointing out that uh, our council of chairs that you're coming back in May to work with the principals and the school council chairs and school councils. So we are, you know, continuing to, to feed that whole theme right through the entire year, which is something that many people who probably are on the online tonight don't know. So um, this has really been something that we're working through together with the school board to try and get, you know, to, to find ways to be more engaging and, and also be more welcoming at the school level. Okay, we are coming to the end of our evening. I am going to ask one more question, the rest of the questions. Um, we, we're at 67 questions, so we can't sit here and, and have Karen answer them all. We will take note of them all, and we will pass them along to her. Um, we will make this presentation uh, available online at a, a later date, so you can look at them again, and uh, hopefully we'll have all the questions afterwards as well. Um, Karen, the last question. What tips do you have for parents when they have concerns about their kids that need to be taken up with a teacher. Many teachers do not welcome this type of collaboration. Well, you know, what, when I was deputy superintendent in Boston and family members would tell me that um, they were having problems uh, connecting with a child's teacher, I would encourage them to then go up um, the chain of command and speak with the principal or the assistant principal um, and then if they didn't get anywhere they then came to me and so I would would encourage you if you if you're having trouble um, again um, I always recommend that uh, you go in with a positive mindset and um, you know are, are, are diplomatic and you know my grandmother used to always uh, say the honey approach try that first uh, before, before the vinegar approach. Uh, but if you're not uh, able to make those connections, and, and I don't think all teachers um, have that attitude. I know many, many teachers now, um, and especially teachers I've worked with around the country, you know, we're really changing the dynamic between home and school. That's really the work that I do. That's, that's my area of focus. Is how do we change that relationship, build those more respectful, more trusting, more welcoming, relationships between home and school. That That's the focus of my work. And so I am finding that school staff around the world are beginning to realize that engaging families and being partners with families um, is really important to really helping the student. Because you know, families know a lot about their kids and a lot of that knowledge actually in many cases is very helpful to the teacher, is very helpful to, for the administrators. So the more that families and teachers and school staff and community members talk to each other, first of all, you know, the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so it takes a lot of burden. I know a lot of a lot of school staff don't believe this until they've tried it, but they find out that working with families actually makes their jobs a lot easier because now they have a partner. So, um, you know, again, I think, uh, you know, try your best to make those connections, but speak to the principal. But what I'm really hoping is that we are going to change the way um, this relationship works between home and school. Well, thank you very much, Karen. As we mentioned, that was our last question for this evening. We'd really like to take the opportunity now to thank you for all of your involvement. Uh, tonight is just one of several sessions that Karen has done with our parents. Um, as Josh mentioned, she, or Lisa, I'm sorry, mentioned, she 
uh, Karen did come out to our Council of Chairs in the fall. She's coming out again in the spring, and likewise, she's also spoken to the board. So we really do appreciate all the valuable information that you provide to all of us um, as we work to become engaged with our children. I'd also like to thank all of those parents who signed on tonight and were, from the feedback, really appreciated this session. And we can tell that we do have a community who actively wants to become involved with their children and make this parent school um, children community all work together. So again, thank you. We will be providing, um, we have recorded this session, so we will make this available for people to go back to. Likewise, we have recorded the questions. Um, there are a number we didn't get to, so hopefully we can um, talk to Karen and see if maybe we can get some of those answers and get those out to you at another point. So thank you all, and uh, it was great to have the webinar and not have to worry about the snow that we have tonight. So enjoy the rest of your evening.